viewers, the gateway. The gateway drive theory. And I refer you to a CCAP study of St. Lucia, where they pointed out that St. Lucia and people, young people who use drugs or use substances, at 11.3 years, they start using alcohol. At 12.9 years, they start using cannabis. In other words, alcohol before cannabis. In addition, 85% of our youth are using alcohol and 25% are using cannabis. The point being, if you were looking for a gateway drug in solution, you would say it's alcohol. However, the whole idea of a gateway drug theory is being debunked. And we're talking more about the common liability to addiction, where it's a person who has the issue. So for instance, if I have an issue, I then look for a, look for a substance to cope. I look for a substance that's easy to find, such as alcohol or cannabis. And I will use it. It is, in fact, adverse childhood experiences. If you have more than four adverse childhood experiences, you have a seven times greater risk of using a substance. Believe it or not, the irony of this is one of the um, adverse childhood experiences is somebody in prison. Our current regime of, of criminalizing cannabis actually puts a lot of people from families in prison. In fact, the cannabis itself, or our regime, our cannabis control mechanism, our criminalized regime, is actually causing adverse childhood experiences. Addiction. 10% of people who use cannabis will become addicted. But people who become addicted are daily users with high THC content product and usually with adolescent initiation. Driving under the influence. Yes, cannabis can impair your driving, your psychomotor disturbance. However, it's not as dangerous as alcohol. Emergency room increases. Yes, we do have, have increased emergency room visits, um, especially as I mentioned with the edibles. However, you would appreciate that if you have good education, you can deal with that. There's a fear of post-legalization, increased use and impact on other substances. However, if you look at Portugal, 70 years of decriminalization, Portugal's drug use has actually dropped. In other words, if you have a good regime and you, and you have good education and good services, you can actually reduce the use of substances and, of course, have responsible use of the substance cannabis. I want to mention a few more adverse before I go into the benefits. Low birth weight has been associated, bronchitis, the, 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 the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders does list a series of disorders that is associated with cannabis. There's moderate evidence of memory, cognition, and school performance impairment, especially again with adolescent use. There's um, sorry, no, okay. Thank you. Um, there's a hyperemesis syndrome that has been described. Now let me talk about medicinal use for a minute. There's conclusive or, or substantial evidence that cannabis can be used to ameliorate pain, nausea, vomiting, muscle spasms in a wide variety of conditions, including multiple sclerosis and ALS, anti-inflammatory conditions such as or it has anti-inflammatory impact such as arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome. We can use cannabis in sleep disorders for seizures. We can use it for anxiety disorders, for post-traumatic stress. We can use it, as I mentioned earlier, for psychosis, to prevent psychosis. We can use it to ameliorate dementia. We can use it in wasting syndromes. We use it for glaucoma. We use it to reduce opioid use, especially in pain. And we can use it for anti-cancer and even anti-HIV transmission. So and we need a new legal regime that minimizes harm, maximizes benefits, reduces violence, improves health, increases wealth, and reduces the social inequality. What do we need? Ensure a regulated product with regulated CBD to THC ratios, with product labeling and information. Eliminate synthetic cannabinoids and high-THC cannabis. Prevent adolescent use. Establish a minimum age for use. Provide medicinal compounds. Ensure human rights, religious power, Rastafarian brothers, health and privacy rights. Reduce violence, establish robust social, psychosocial, drug rehabilitation services, provide effective education programs, schools and public education that is, produce and provide government revenues, provide economic opportunity, prohibit marketing and commercialization because of Liberal, um, liberalized legal environment is the wrong one. 
you need a strict controlled legal environment, limit public smoking, do not make edibles attractive, establish driving under the influence um, um, controls. What we are talking about, and the current court report says it very well, hybrid legislation with strict regulation and prohibition of harmful use, incrementally moving to the leg of legalization with strict regulatory control. My appeal to you, open your mind, reject the propaganda that has been pushed at us for years. Let science guide you. You need to reject the status quo that creates more harm than the substance itself creates. I want you to embrace an opportunity to create an environment that addresses root causes of the problems in our society. This is more than about cannabis. We need to find a way to address root causes, social inequity, poverty, poor health. And I, and I believe that a legal regime would do this, allow us to use the cannabis for its most potent, powerful, beneficial impacts and minimize the harmful use of cannabis. Thank you very much. Good evening again. Good evening. Uh, this is Mr. Dr. Kenny Torrey for our presentation. Distinguished members, once again, President of the Bar Association, the NYC, and all guests here. All guests here, distinguished. Thanks for coming again. It's a change world. It's a global change. It really is. I want to quickly just mention a few authorities I would feel fair not mentioning. I know time is limited. The Carry Conservation Report is one of the most authoritative, deeply scholarly, multifaceted reports, and it's particularly applicable to us right here, right now. August 2018, dealing with medical, religious, crime, and social justice concerns. They pretty much deal with everything. Our premises, my premises particularly, are largely based on their findings, covered with independent, regional, and international literature, all reference where appropriate. In essence, we echo the commission, but um, the commission accepts an echo in the global thought. Also, the report of the National Commission on Ganja to the PM of Jamaica on August 2001 transform the international tribunal to think tank how to regulate cannabis, a practical guide, as well as a Canadian government discussion paper by the Task Force on Marijuana Legalization and Regulation called Tool Legalization, Regulation and Restriction of Access to Marijuana. Yes, yeah, we only have a significant moment in this issue. So let's see, all of us right there. Globally, multiple jurisdictions are debating, developing, and implementing models of cannabis regulation as we sit here right now. The question has shifted decisively. It's no longer do we maintain prohibition. It's what, how will legal regulation work? The most used illicit drug in the world, 183 million people, World Drug Report 2017. Despite extensive controls, punitive measures, millions of dollars, hour after hours. This usage cuts across all social classes, professions, income brackets, and race. It's just too clear that regional attitudes themselves are now corresponding to global environmental attitudes. There's been a considerable shift. Some surveys, five surveys by the cadres, the CARICOM, and Caribbean Development Research Services Incorporated. It's very instructive in that regard. Caribbean states themselves have begun legal reform and is anticipated that the movement is only going to grow stronger, particularly because of the medical and the economic benefits involved. And the sums being thrown around are large. That's the public view, people on the ground. But there are also persons who are even more on the ground as regards cannabis and its regulation, and that's the police. It would be fair to not have their views. What I'm going to give is a very quick synopsis of what the police are seeing regionally and echoed by some global thought by law enforcement. Prohibition is ineffective and inefficient. Not only that, it leads to criminality. You ask why. Incarcerated persons induces criminality. We create harder criminals by placing persons who are committing non victim based crimes alongside hardened murderers, rapists, God knows who else. Then the stigma and the 
of the seniors rendered them more vulnerable than before. Some of these guys are not like many of us and forced to make things happen. The police are saying that the criminality is not from the use of cannabis, which itself is clear and evident to most intellectual thinkers, but from the protecting of turf. In fact, the police say there's very little correlation between cannabis and violent crime. Crime in this region here is not the prevalence of a drug use lifestyle, but the drug trade itself. You see, unlike other drugs, where our country and region is the main primary electronic shipment point, cannabis is produced and consumed by many locals in every Caribbean country, and the violence is due to the requirements because it's illicit to protect the crops and then protect the tools to sell those crops. The cost of this prohibitive regime, this was a really touching. Estimates are placing persons convicted of minor drug related offenses as cons constituted the bulk of our prison population. Some of the police here might be even that already in the Caribbean Commonwealth, but the numbers are looking like 43 to 60 percent majority young offenders. I think that's New Jersey. To juxtapose this to the US, they call it a costly failure. That's what the FBI called it. In 2014, listen clearly. 45% of all arrests, that's 700,993 arrests were for drugs. I'll be not only cannabis, let me make that clear. 88% of that number, I just told you, 45%. 88% was for simple possession, not even sale or manufacture. This is from the FBI, uh, crime in US 2040, Washington, D.C., U.S. Department of Justice. We have some legal and economic challenges, economic challenges, sorry. But before I go into those, I just want to address what is the number one concern that's always been the world over. People believe if you legalize cannabis, you're going to get a spike in use. We call it a spike in use here. I can tell you the evidence is showing clearly that there's an initial increase immediately after the call the experimental factor. It definitely balances out over time. In fact, in most cases, it goes lower. Legitimacy of the law. In fact, very quickly, if anybody wants information on that full of point on the um, spike in use experimentation factor, the right the rule is out, cannabis policy will be on a scale date. Um, the Oxford University Press, 2010. Legitimacy of the law. Law involving criminal penalties must be informed by clear policy rationales, all the way to the tenure right, and others. We consider the mischief, the harm that has to be cured, and we create solutions. Most times that harm is done to others. Sometimes it can be done to yourself vis-a-vis -vis suicide, etc. But there are many natural substances that are harmful, which are not criminalized. Tobacco, even Jamaican Aki, some of the studies are mentioning. The harsh penalties. Laws in the region are all similar, some call it draconian. In Guyana recently there was a public outcry when a young husband got three years in jail for eight grams of cannabis. Now, some laws, let's, make, let's be fair, some laws do allow for fines instead of imprisonment, like here in St. Lucia. But the statistics are showing that the arrest profile is indicated that the low income persons who are being the ones arrested and fined. So when they cannot afford the fines, I call it personal the double negative, it's ridiculous. They end up, they can't afford the fines, the state gets no revenue. They end up in jail, criminalized, get out, and then we have to deal with them. Yeah. The financial character problem. We are going to miss vital state benefits if we leave it illegal. Even decriminalization is not enough. It's just too late. We have already missed the boat. It's not going to be cured. The new regime, if we leave it illegal, decriminalize, the new regime will have to address the status and facilitation of health, which has proven industrial and commercial benefits. We can't even go to that now. That is proven scientifically. Patent, customs, laws, regulation of pharmacies and pharmaceuticals like we all spoke of, and amendments of anti monogamy and proceeds of crime legislation. There's a really tricky, trickiness in companies overseas operating marijuana businesses trying to transact with the banks and the financial institutions because the, your profits are looked at as the proceeds of crime. We have to look at patenting opportunities. There's huge interest as a medical substance, as the doctor rightly said. The varieties of cannabis in this region, the studies are showing, are superior and of unique quality. We do not even know what we have. Interest by the large foreign companies who acquire stakes in our seeds and related materials, if we don't protect them, of course they will be exploited without any or any adequate benefit to us. Before you know it, we'll have large companies here with foreign patents of 
region of substance these are products. They generate the problem and put it into a market value. Mm -hmm. The regional law reforms in the three countries in the region have removed prohibition. This is very important, people. Jamaica, Belize, and Tiga and Barbuda, most recently, where I've been and I've had an ability to take it in somewhat. They want to decriminalize small amounts. What is important is they call it the self payment decriminalization models. We're trying to be polite. We're still looking at the international community, which I will get onto shortly. The self labor decriminalization models, but are actually hybrid constructs. They are hybrid constructs incorporating elements of legalization and decriminalization. Let me show you why. In Jamaica right now, it's legal to have five plants of cannabis growing in a private home, and take us four. That means that de facto, they have legalized cultivation, albeit on a human rights type of angle, to grow in a private home. This guy, you can't put this private home, that's a waste of resources. So that's legalization. But watch Antigua, they have no provision for ticket and offenses for any offense under their parent statutes. That's why a lot of staff with regulations by the minister. So they don't have to bring in a new statute, but they can now give you a ticket instead of criminally charging you. That is decriminalization. I'm just showing you how they merged two concepts, and at the end I will show you why that's what we have to do. We are a little island out in the ocean, we can't do it alone, we have to be very careful. International considerations. Here's the problem. It was classified as a dangerous, classified as a dangerous drug by the narcotic schedules 1 and 2, four, sorry, of the UN Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. They call it the uh, Single Convention. Requires all of us states to adopt their measures, um, establishing criminal offenses, any activity, any activity, medical or otherwise, related to so-called narcotics. That was then, this is now. We have serious calls for these international standards to be amended and take account of the scientific evidence that is just growing and growing and growing. Several countries have breached these conventions. These instruments are no longer seen as authoritative, given that international law is based on consensus of states. So what do we need? I have the ideal model here. It's not legalization for medicinal use only, as some people do. That's a narrow perspective. We're ignoring many parameters. We're going to shortchange the Caribbean people. Small farmers, entrepreneurs, indigenous scientists pushed out of the boat. Ridiculous. Decriminalization of small amounts as the others do. It falls within the framework of prohibition. It's not perfect. It needs some justice imperatives. Remains unlawful, so it does not discourage the black market. It also fails to stimulate the regional homegrown industry, medical research, all viable routes to economic development, which is what we're looking for. The liberal legalization model was mentioned by Dr. King. That's over commercialization. Just let people come in and do what they want. It's no longer illegal. Everybody go at home. We can't contain it. We can't control it. We do it too small. What we need is legalization. We call it a hybrid model incremental approach. Legalization does not mean grow smoke everywhere. Not at all. We incorporate elements of decrim and legalization with the objectives and emphasis on public health, citizen security, and the economic benefits. Certain activities are going to remain prohibited. High potency cannabis will be banned, as the region might not have the capacity to deal with this yet. Cannabis in private homes, of course, permitted, emphasizing the human rights to privacy and health identified in recent judicial precedents, acknowledging <coughs> inefficacy of police in private households as well. And the kind of people in public spaces, of course, minus the rest of the areas, who are free to practice sacramentally within reason. We're going to have a high regulated commercial sector, medical products, production supply, and trade is going to be lawful through a strict regulatory regime. That itself will address the proceeds of crime species that we have. If distribution is too restrictive, people want it, the black market will thrive. We need a regime accompanied by public health objectives, regulated marketing, labeling factors that encourage responsible use. Legal regulation is not a separate legal norm, it's consent controls. We've been in reports like alcohol, tobacco, age limits, licensing requirements, quality controls. In conclusion, the current regime facilitates harm, it minimizes benefits. Our goal should be to minimize harm, maximize benefits. I can't say much more in time constraints. Thanks for having me.
to our organizers, fellow panelists, esteemed guests, and members of the public, a pleasant evening to you. This evening, my team and I oppose the motion that cannabis should be legalized in St. Lucia. For us to clearly understand the issues being scrutinized, I will define a few key, key terms. Legalized, as defined by the OxfordDictionaries.com, means to make something that was previously illegal permissible by law. And believe it or not, folks, I actually struggled to find an adequate de definition for cannabis. <laughs> but from my research, cannabis is a single species from the from the family Cannabacea. And from that species, of course, like Dr. King points out, there are several uh, other species. But primarily, there are two species. Some often call it the male and the female plant. Some call it hemp, the male plant hemp, and the female plant marijuana. And I heard somebody said, Henry and Mary. <laughs> It is a known fact that marijuana has several effects on the brain. Some include, but are not limited to, impaired memory, altered senses, and in idosis can cause hallucinations, delusions, and psychosis. Especially if, you're already, if you already have a family history of psychotic disorders or mental illnesses. And I don't have to stress on that much further because Dr. King has already helped my point in that case. There's also studies, of course, that have shown that marijuana usage at an early age can affect brain development and lower IQ. And once again, Dr. King has let us know that it also affects the performance for students and students. And being in the dental field, field, I can tell you that smoking marijuana also causes Disease. Now, we're all aware of the many benefits of and uses of cannabis, so it would be unwise of me to even begin to deny or argue against such facts. But myself and my team members, are, what we're arguing is that St. Lucia, at this time, is not equipped to handle the ramifications or consequences of the full legalization of cannabis. And as such, it should not be legal, made legal. I will make my stance clear by expounding on two points. One, <laughs> St. Lucia have shown such poor management and regulation of our current industries that are so much easier to control, far less a cannabis industry. And second, the legalization of cannabis will lead to an increase in criminal activities through the guns for drugs trade. And once again, folks, my opposing team has made this very clear. It is also a belief that making cannabis legal at this point in time will end up causing St. Lucia more harm than good, as what you're asking St. Lucia to do, fellow panelists, is to fly before she learns to creep. My fellow panelists, I will rescind my point if you can show me one industry in St. Lucia, medical, agricultural, or otherwise, that is properly managed, regulated, and is also owned by St. Lucians. I will wait. And I really don't have to go far to see the errors of poor management and regulation. Look at alcohol. As a friend of mine would say, a glass of alcohol and they keep the doctor away. But we know the negative effects of alcohol. It is supposed to be regula a regulated substance. No one under the age of 18 should consume alcohol. But is that happening? No. I have even heard of instances of students showing up to school intoxicated. And I mind you, you can't go alcohol in your backyard. Far less cannabis, where if made legal, would mean that almost anyone would be able to grow and possibly consume it. 
And once again, they let you know that you can grow, in, in Antigua and Jamaica, you can grow five, up to five marijuana plants. Another thing we also have to acknowledge is the fact that St. Lucia has not implemented any new laws or regulation towards smoking in public. Despite the known fact that secondhand smoking is just as detrimental. Now, just imagine a St. Lucia where cannabis is legal. You would get high if I just passed in Rosalie. <laughs> now, to my second point. Did you know that the drugs for guns trade in the Caribbean is worth over 17 billion US dollars? And this is according to the Trinidad and Tobago Guardian. Having said that, what then would stop criminals from using St. Lucia's proposed lax laws on, on cannabis to increase their efforts in participating in such a trade? What would stop someone from posing as a legitimate cannabis producer while trading marijuana for guns? And don't tell me proper regulation, because we have all seen where that has failed. According to the West Indian Commission, nothing poses a greater threat to civil society in Caribbean countries than the drug problem. Nothing exemplifies the powerlessness of regional governments more. The Caribbean, in general, is at the center of the illegal and extremely dangerous situation due to its central location between South America sources and North America sources and of course the European markets. And this is often dubbed the transatlantic drugs trade. And St. Lucia is ideal for such illicit activities. Just a short boat ride and you're in Europe. The illegal trafficking of firearms and drugs carried out by domestic and transnational gangs are one of the leading causes of crime in Caribbean nations. This trade aids in the funding and upkeep of dangerous criminal gangs, and this is according to the Association of Caribbean Police Chiefs. Folks, how the trade works is that the criminal from one country provides the drugs and the other provides the guns. So I give you drugs, you give me guns. I fear that an increase in such activities is exactly what will happen in St. Lucia. I mean, it's already happening, but with the legalization of cannabis, I fear it will only make matters worse. Jamaica took the bold step in 2015 to amend their drugs, their Dangerous Drugs Act, to allow for the legalized use of marijuana in defined circumstances when they are already, it is already, there's already known drug for guns trade between Jamaica, Haiti, and America. Haiti and America provide the guns. Jamaica provides the drugs. In most cases, marijuana. According to a report by the Jamaica Gleaner, in the year 2016, 581 illegal guns were seized. In 2017, 786 guns were seized. And in now 2018, illegal guns have been so rampant that the government is having to amend their firearms act to deal with the problem. There has been drastic increases in crime with the numbers of murders in 2017 being the second highest in recorded history. And I can tell you because I'm a Jamaican. Is there a correlation between Jamaica's lax laws against cannabis and this increase in illegal firearms and crime? I will leave you to decide. Our stance is clear. Creep before you fly, or even walk. The government of St. Lucia can hardly regulate the sale and use of alcohol by our youths. How are they going to effectively control and regulate the use of marijuana? And what would stop anyone from growing and trading marijuana for guns or money in the black market? Certainly not our security forces that are already so underfunded and ill-equipped. And most certainly not the United States, where the federal government still deems cannabis an illegal substance. The U.S. federal, 
U.S. federal government already gives U.S. states that have legalized marijuana such a hard time in their efforts. Far less St. Lucia, a Caribbean developing country. It is so bad, folks, that you can't, you can't even use federal government water to grow your marijuana plants. And of course, some federal banks, they refuse to take funding from persons who are in the marijuana industry. Think about it. This sudden drive to legalize marijuana, folks, is just a way for big corporations to profit off small countries like ourselves. We see companies such as Coca-Cola buying thousands of shares in marijuana. Big corporations and countries are already miles ahead in research, development, and production of cannabis, cannabis products. Truly, think about it. If other countries like ourselves do not legalize cannabis, who will they sell their products to? After all, I'm sure our panelists don't expect, expect us to believe that St. Lucia is going to compete with the likes of Canada or even Jamaica in research and production. I implore you all, be realistic. Wake up and smell the coca tea. <laughs> or as our millennials would say, stay woke, say no to cannabis legalization. At this point in the proceedings, as is most respectful, I offer greetings of goodwill to the distinguished individuals mentioned by our esteemed master of ceremonies, as well as my fellow debaters. It would be remiss of me not to extend similar courtesies to the members of my encouraging Big Adams family, fellow Toastmasters, members of the Bar Association, and our other state EGS here this evening. I am Johan Bullix, representing the Toastmasters. I'm aware that I am exuding an air of confidence at this time, and it's simply because I have two accomplished women in my corner, Toastmaster Trisha and Richard, and the other chambers. The topic we're discussing this evening of recent times has ascended to the zenith of controversy. Naturally, it was only a matter of time before the question was posed to this nation for profound deliberation. The topic up for discussion this evening, should St. Lucia legalize cannabis? I find it interesting that we have uh, sites from so many different newspapers and so on, but I haven't heard anything from the St. Lucia Times, The Voice, or even one of the more popular ones, uh, St. Lucia News Online. I plan to go to the St. Lucia Library and show you that as a country, we are simply not ready. We're ill-equipped to legalize cannabis. Our team believes that this nation, after celebrating 39 years of independence, is simply not yet mature enough to support legalized cannabis. My partner this evening, Toastmaster Richards, touched on two very noteworthy points. First, the nation has shown poor management and, and poor regulation sorry, of our current industries. She raised the question, why should we expect differently with a new industry, in this case it being the cannabis industry? Second, legalization of cannabis can stoke the flames of criminal activity uh, using the gun for tree, as a, the gun for drug trade, sorry, as a medium. <clears throat> It is more than our ambition to present an, an arguable case. We are here today, much like our opposition, as concerned sons and daughters of the soil. Our presence here today speaks volumes of our pledge to be socially responsible citizens. With the burden of this pledge in mind, I will now share two key elements towards this issue with you, both tailored to the uniqueness of this nation. <clears throat> Let me call to your attention the recent issues relating to gun and gun violence amongst the youth of St. Lucia. One of the most notorious cases 
is of a young man caught with a handgun and 11 rounds of ammunition. Kerry McPhee, age 20, dubbed McFinger after flashing, sorry, after flashing a finger when he appeared in court to face his charges. According to the findings of the World Macroeconomic Meter, St. Lucia's youth unemployment rate sits at 40.8% of the labor force ages 15 to 24. This indicates a marked lack of, a marked correction, a lack of opportunity for youth. Coupled with the evidence of alarming attitudinal change, this shows that it is not the best, it is not the best interest of the nation to align itself with a stance which condones cannabis. It may sound harsh, considering the many proposed medical applications of cannabis as pointed out by Dr. King. According to the Business Insider on March 7, 2018, it listed the following. Cannabis decreases the symptoms of a severe seizure disorder known as Dravet syndrome. Honestly, I never heard about that until then. And tests have shown cannabis stop cancer from spreading in the cells of the cell culture, cell culture, sorry, tested. Amazing, huh? If that were the only merits of cannabis, I don't think we would be in the form that we are in today. There's risks, risk, sorry, of addiction, which is showing one out of 10 users becoming addicted to the drug. It can also alter brain development, especially among adolescents. Of course, we've heard that quite a few times this evening. Studies show that people who started smoking cannabis in their teens showed signs of lower IQs in their 30s compared to the childhood. To the childhood. This brings new meaning to the phrase, once a man, twice a child. As of right now, St. Lucia has no policy on maintaining clean air, which means that there are no notable consequences for smoking in public areas. The people rely on smokers to use their discretion. I wish I was able to cite testimonials on the info of St. Lucia using their, their discretion, but unfortunately I was never able to find a story like that. I see many sites, but it was super ugly. Moving on, I'm sure many of us uh, smokers and non-smokers alike have experienced inconsiderate smokers. Consider this, with cannabis, there's the additional concern of catching, to reference pop culture, a contact high. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg, for your, I beg you for your grace this evening for Actually, forgive me, sorry, for not mentioning sooner the whooping boys of the legalized cannabis movement, Mr. Alcohol and Mr. Tobacco. These four guys have taken quite a beating this evening. The stats reflecting the number of deaths caused by alcohol and tobacco per annum will shock most of us who enjoy a cold pizza on a Friday night line. The one comfort, comforting sorry for it is that there are laws which prevent access to these drugs by minors and those who abuse them. Even I must agree, it is an irrepeatable fact. Yes, there are laws enacted, but are they effectively enforced? Can it be said without reasonable doubt that all establishments that serve alcohol in St. Lucia are licensed? Can it be stated that all establishments in St. Lucia that serve alcohol request ID as proof of one attaining legal drinking age? Ladies and gentlemen, Fair Helen has a lot of cleaning up to do before it can invite another vice to nestle in its heart. And its heart belongs to its home, who form the legacy of its people. The nation needs to place emphasis on fixing what's broken. The nation needs to enforce the neglected laws that abandoned and made impotent. Finding affirmative courses of action to reduce the levels of gun and, and gun violence amongst its youth, and developing opportunities which can lead to gainful employment for its youth. On the subject of gainful employment, uh, employment sorry, I present my second point. Is the nation of St. Lucia able to cultivate and sustain a thriving cannabis product? <coughs> the stories all over the web centered on nations who have or are looking to legalize cannabis uh, shows that this has piqued and shows that this has piqued the interest of big tobacco companies who have a major interest in legalized cannabis. According to a US news house, ironically titled The High Times, on February 24, 2018, due to a larger recreational market, new investment opportunities in cannabis appeals to big tobacco. Steadily but surely, tobacco companies are investing in cannabis. Translation. 
there are now numerous wealthy international entities interested in industrialized cannabis that will capitalize on St. Lucia's submissive history and agreeable view of privatization. Allow me to elaborate. In the 1998-99 budget address, the government of St. Lucia published the three priorities that guides its privatization agenda. One, to withdraw from areas of commercial activity in which its presence is no longer needed. Two, to minimize the drain on the public goods created by insufficient state-owned enterprises. Three, to follow for broad-based, to allow, sorry, for broad-based private investment and ownership in the financially viable assets of the state. These are the guidelines which do not come off as aggressive to me. I'm not sure how it comes off um, to you. I think one of our panelists made mention of our laws and the ineffectiveness a few minutes ago. <clears throat> In the interest of remaining current, I will digress. At this time, I will cite an article published by Luke St. Lucia with the catchy headline, Medical Association Demands Dialogue and Owen King EU Privatization. Under different circumstances, I'd seek the views of Dr. King, but alas. In the interest of time, I'll press forward. The subject of privatization was revisited this time, sometime, sorry, ago. Uh, Private interest had shown an interest in the Uranura International Airport. It should be no surprise to the people of St. Lucia when privatization rolls into town. Ponder on the number of our services that are just another portfolio under the umbrella of some giant Fortune 500 glutton. The telecommunications, telecommunications sorry, company, Flow, took a step further by monopolizing our entertainment utilities. We witnessed the absorption of CFL by massive stores. Our electricity has been privatized for years. The once Leviathan banana industry, in days of old, it blessed many St. Lucians with a livelihood by all rights, should top the list of privatization gone wrong. An article written in the April 22nd digital issue of the Star St. Lucia featured the results of a poverty assessment done in the years 2005 to 2006, which indicate the fall in banana earnings was the main cause and sustaining factor of poverty in St. Lucia. During the state's high public debt, which falls in the range of 70% of its gross domestic product. Its list of priorities on its privatization agenda, and of course, the enthusiasm of the big tobacco companies. Companies, I must add, that are willing to present multiple paths to erase the dream on the public boost. The people of this nation should ask themselves, who would come out on top if the nation were to legalize cannabis? We ought to follow the lessons taught by the results of the Harvard Business Review focused on privatization. The publisher noted the following. Ownership, whether private or public, is not the issue. The key question is, under what conditions will a profit-seeking organization act in the best interest of the public? Thank you. So guys, uh, since I didn't come prepared yep. to give any talks during the period of uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, good evening once again. I'm going to try to be very quick. It's a bit off the cuff, but this is our uh, small rebuttal. Uh, essentially, we've tried to put together what it is they've uh, rebutted, and it would seem that they're saying that ineffective laws are no justification for new laws, and in some respects, I am of that view, but not in this case. What we are saying is that it's clear that we very quickly need new laws. The world is changing around us. The laws are changing around us. We're going to get stuck. Um, we're going to get stuck. You mentioned privatization. We are saying, no, 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 no. Um, privatization is great when it's great, but that's not essentially what we're saying. What we're saying is what you call strict regulation. And I'll briefly make a distinct, distinction between the legalization model that Canada has adopted now and what we are asking for. There is legalization with strict regulation. There's two variants. The state will control supply and basically controls everything else and allows for a small amount of commercialization. That's not ideal. The other variant is the state is legalized, but the state controls supply through consumption levels, areas of use, and so on, and they allow a lot more free market use. If you look to the CARICOM report, what they say is that is the ideal model with the best economic potential benefit for us here in the region. However, we can't use it just yet. We respect our own limitations on our resources, um, our numbers. That is why we ask for this model, but we call it a hybrid construct. It's essentially adopting that same model and tweaking it from the lessons we've learned, we Jamaica, Uruguay, Canada, South America recently, I understand St. Vincent have a couple of bills before their parliament now. We take the best of the best, but the message tonight is really that we have to move. Um, it's, it's a domino effect. The law, see what's very funny, and the CARICOM report mentions this. It's, all, it's, it's ludicrous that scientific and medical evidence was not at the forefront of the decision making. Back in those early 90s when they prohibited cannabis sativa, as is more better than known in some regards. However, we're here now with some of the same very interest, corporate and otherwise, trying to use scientific and medical evidence to justify continued prohibition. You can't have two bites at the cherry. The evidence is here, it's speaking, we have our kids to protect. He said that legalized legal, uh, regulation and solution doesn't work. Alcohol and so on, we have a failure to regulate, and it's happening now. That's clear. I mean, that's very clear. However, we are failing and paying the price of cannabis as well. Cannabis is just as freely available as alcohol for those who want it. It's just that the numbers are showing you that alcohol is more dangerous than cannabis, and some persons don't necessarily like that. We would never treat um, the potential effects of persons with predispositions to psychoactive tendencies lightly. It's very important. That's why we have strict controls on the potency of cannabis that's allowed, strict controls for our customs laws for the regulation of importation and exportation, but we cannot deny our older persons the benefits of the arthritis treatment, our younger persons, they, there's just too many benefits to speak of within the five minute time frame, but it's important that we get a move on. It was also mentioned that we're not mature enough, and, and that, that kind of struck a chord with me. So immediately I asked myself, well, maybe it's true, maybe we're not mature enough. So what do we do? Do we stand around and continue to not be mature enough? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was mentioned that there's a sudden drive. Everybody's all of a sudden pushing cannabis, pushing cannabis. I literally wanted to ask, where have you guys been all along? This is no sudden drive. This has been going on from the days of prohibition. This has been a long time coming. On the drugs for guns, we are aware that there is a drug for gun street. I mean, there's a anything for gun street, there's a gun street. <laughs> but we are saying that with effective and proper regulation of this hybrid model of legalization of cannabis within tight confines of citizen security motives that the police will have more time and resources to tackle the same very country. Lastly, they said um, you don't fix, you only fix what's broken. We're saying that the prohibition is broken, it's clear. It's not meeting its objectives. People are getting harmed. They are unable to be treated. 
Um, there's a lack of information. People are buying cannabis in dark corners. There are people who will not go to dark corners, and um, we need to increase the safety. Thank you very much. of St. Lucia, our prohibition issue is not as grand as, say, the U.S. or some other bigger nations. For us, we need to focus on the issues that are unique to us, and I believe I opened with that statement, unique issues to St. Lucia, that is what we need to fix in. When it comes to the alcohol uh, treat, for example, there's a, there's a passage that says that with alcohol and tobacco, it shows that the tax revenue from these substances do not even begin to cover the costs associated with them. Federal excise, excise taxes collected on alcohol in 2002 totaled 8.3 billion, which is only 4.5 of the 1.8 billion in alcohol-related costs, such as lost productivity and increased healthcare spending. There is a trend which shows that in order to make, you must lose and that the alcohol industry is not exempt from that. They take the loses as well. And this is why I ask the question again, who would really benefit? When we decide to legalize cannabis in St. Lucia, are we saying that the possibility of gaining some economic revenue outweigh the social costs? Maturity is something that we need to keep in mind. You said that maybe we should take action to prevent us from staying stagnant and remaining immature. I agree, that's a marvel. But what action should we take? Who determines which actions that we should take? Are we going to take actions again that favor bigger companies coming in and reaping the benefits, whereas the St. Lucian people end up with very little to promote their livelihoods? I'm going to end here. Thank you very much, Yuan. We now come to the point of the evening where the debate aspect of it is completed, and we now open the floor to any questions that the audience may have to either one of the team for and against. I'm sure that if you have any questions, Okay, Mike, um, before we go to you, please pose your question. Please indicate which of the two teams that you are putting the question to. Um, just before we take the questions, let me thank the panel. Um, brilliant, what can I say? Um, I mean, I can ask you to choose who you think was the best speaker there. Um, or your favorite speaker, but I, I can't decide, so I don't think you can either. Um, I'll choose Morris. This was my colleague, I don't know. Yes, you're biased. All that side or anything like that. Um, so, uh, can I just say a small disclaimer with what, we, uh, what I forgot to make at the beginning was that the panelists. Um, they're not necessarily for the side that they're arguing. But you know, because it's in the interest of public debate, and we know that both sides need to put forward, need to be put forward, they um, agree to do this debate or whatever side. I think it's going to be super fun. Um, but yes, I mean, you could tell because they were so passionate and the speakers were so good. Um, so just put your hand together. 
um, now I'd like Mr. Sanchez, we're going to um, open the floor for uh, first of all some questions. Um, we can take comments afterwards, but if you have any um, questions for anyone in the panel of themselves, um, just straight on and then I'll come to you. Um, but as I have a mic, I'll take that one later. Ask a question, please. Um, it's for anybody on the panel. Um, it's, it's something that you know I have pointed as well. Do you think that in the direction things are going, if we achieve legalization of marijuana, cannabis, what you call it, that means that eventually that will open the gates for other quote unquote soft drugs. Um, which have been placed on the same, on the same level, maybe not the taken out now, things like LSD and ecstasy, I believe. Well, you can confirm because in about 2009, the chief, uh, the chief advisor to the UK he came out and said that you know things like that were on the same level, and he doesn't see why the government are fighting it so hard um, because they're not uh, like other drugs, he, he put them in the same bracket. So I mean, I'm not sure, I'm just saying there's a lot of fun that we can have now, I mean, just be, you know. So does that, if we achieve legalization, does that open the door for other drugs such as LSD and anything else that might, be, like magic mushrooms? Magic mushrooms are natural. You know, if we legalize cannabis, part of the legalization of cannabis also means, as we indicated in the regime, where you Develop an education of people. So there's school education, then public education on the use of substances. It's important that we address use of all substances in education. Now, cannabis is different from those other substances that you mentioned because cannabis has clear beneficial purposes. So cannabis is slightly different from the other drugs that you have mentioned. But the root of stopping all drugs is actually to have healthy people to have um, well-educated people, people who uh, uh, have the right social services and, and, and support in place. Um, so I think one of the things we'd like to do with the legalization of cannabis is create resources and revenues that address the root causes of problematic um, um, drug use. Because we want to use cannabis responsibly, use it in Respecting people's human rights, respecting their privacy, respecting their religious um, 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 organizations and rights, respecting and providing medical um, benefits. That's what we want to do. So I, I think that um, if we were to do that, actually it would help us to deal with those other drugs. There are some people that say, for instance, um, that when you allow alcohol and you allow these other drugs to be managed, you can actually keep away some of those those drugs because people are looking for substances to help them to cope. My point is, let's try to get them to cope better. And if they have to use something, let us let them use something that is responsible and legal, such as cannabis. If we get to that regime, are you with me? Because I think that is because cannabis actually has been used as a substance substitute. We use it for um, alcohol withdrawal, and we can use it for um, opioid withdrawal. We can use it because it's a safer drug than either alcohol or um, um, opioids, which is heroin you know, on all drugs. So I think that it is a matter of, 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 of looking at drugs in a more holistic way. Portugal is a wonderful example of doing just that, and I think that's a worthwhile um, study for us to have. But right now, I would not want to muddy the waters too much with talking about other drugs like ecstasy and LSD. At this point in time, maybe you want to focus on this cannabis, which has clear benefits. It's a clearly different drug, has clear benefits, we, we, and it is culturally appropriate to us as well. Um, 
I was going to steal it. It might not see what, not see what banana, but because communist is a new banana. So um, wasn't it also on the pharmacopoeia of the, of the entire planet prior to 1937? Yeah. Um, yeah. And this was um, on, on the medicinal lists of all the uh, countries of the world prior to 1937. The European pharmacopoeia, the American pharmacopoeia, and the Indian pharmacopoeia it was in fact used as a medicine. But, but the human, human race has been using it for six millennia, 6,000 years. Uh, yes. Yes, absolutely. So, so it, it, it's illegality, in fact, it, 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 it was not the norm. It was an introduced uh, status. And now we have been trying to reverse it. It's not a new thing we're trying to introduce today of legalizing it. It was always legal. It was made illegal by some nefarious uh, means. And now we're just trying to put it back the way it was, quite simply. I will give you a scenario. Currently, cigarettes, tobacco, that's a plant, right? Cannabis is a plant, right? It has been proven that both those plants um, do have harmful properties. Cigarettes, as you know, has other, so many other chemicals added to it compared to my one stick, but that's okay, I'm still leaving that alone. Look at this scenario. Bunch of kids chilling out somewhere. Me and my squad happen to be passing on the street. We see them. Our suspicion is aroused. So we go over to them, we search them. Among that group, there is a 16-year-old child, fresh out of secondary school, has so many plans for his life. But what he didn't know was that one of his peers, 16-year-old John, had some money. In fear, he threw it on the ground. Police came, found the weed. Whose word is it? No one is answering. Whose word is it? No one is answering. By the way, guess what we have to do? We arrest everybody. We charge every single person, take them before the court. Court finds them guilty, finds them. And that's okay, that's all right, fine. 16 year old Jack, five years later, is now 20, 21. He's applying for a job, he can't wait. But guess what? He has to produce a character certificate. Police record, he applies for it. And to his horror, he even forgot, he didn't even know. Guess what? On that record, convicted for cannabis. It does not even state a little portion. It doesn't even state the circumstance. All it says is convicted for cannabis. And guess what? He's not employed. In your opinion, is that fair? very much for that terror scenario. I wish my opposing side had <laughs> I even mentioned something like that. I had the proper rebuttal. But I will not deny that this is an issue throughout the world. I mean the US in particular and that's one of the reasons why the Democratic Party who is really in the States for minorities are trying to push the legalization of legalization of marijuana. Because a lot of youths, and, and mostly colored or black people, have been placed in, in prison for years, a ridiculous number of years, because of a small marijuana position. So we're not denying that this is, is definitely an issue. And something that happened in Jamaica once they decriminalized marijuana is that persons who have had records because of small amounts of marijuana use, they clear that off their records. No. In our arguments, we never said that you should never make cannabis legal in St. In Lucia. Our arguments were clear. We are not ready just yet. 
put the necessary measures in place before you jump on the bandwagon of legalization and also ensure that you will not only benefit the government but the little man on the side of the road. Right? Our arguments were very clear in that. I would also like to add to Dr. King's point earlier where he says it's very important that we address the reason why people choose to, to, to use marijuana. Of course, with a side religious purposes. <laughs> Right? Some persons genuinely look to drugs because they're depressed, they, they just need something to get their mind off their current situation. And something that's very commendable that Jamaica did is that a young person caught with possession of, I believe, over or under two ounces of marijuana, they're not, they're fine. Yes, I think it's like 500 Jamaican dollars, which is about... Five easy? No, I don't want to lie. Probably well, ten easy, no. <laughs> so they're fine about ten easy. And most importantly, they are recommended to get counseling from the Jamaica Council of Drug Abuse. So I think that is something he mentioned that some of the persons who are fined, they can't afford to pay the fine. I believe instead of fining them, they should one maybe have to do community service. Find them, and also they have to seek counseling. So if it's if they have any problems, if it's that they're fed up, they're depressed, they're stressed while they're smoking marijuana, then a counselor will be able to help with that. I believe. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. As a president of the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated, um, I very much um, enjoyed this, this this course tonight, um, uh, especially as I, as I enjoyed facts presented by the side for the cannabis. And listening to the, the whole discussion, I just, I, you know, certain points struck out to me. Um, when I heard, I, I heard um, phrases such as the poor management of industries and trying to correlate that with our immaturity to handle um, the, the marijuana industry, uh, the $17 billion drugs for gun trade, I realized here that marijuana was subjectively placed in the bracket of drugs here because we would like to know what is the statistical, um, statistical kind of representation of what percentage of drugs does marijuana represent in this drugs for gun case. Okay. I also, um, the firearms, sorry, statistics, and also a correlation with the lower IQs. And you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> the correlation, of marijuana, between marijuana and lower IQs. <laughs> yeah. Well, I talk about many, we, I mean, we know a lot of people, I don't know if the Einstein is a rumor, Einstein is a rumor, but um, a lot of us here, we grew up in a country where we have two Nobel laureates. And I'm not a Nobel laureate, but I know my example better than everyone else. And I know a lot of us here, we have a, a, we have a real, a real high representation of solutions. So when we go out to study, we normally perform very well. And I am no exception. I'll tell you that. And I've been using the one time. <laughs> so, if, looking at my example, I want to know, you know, based on the discussions presented tonight, um, you know, I would really like to have a list of something of the, the documentation presented. And I'd like to ask the opposing table, uh, you know, I didn't really hear any quotations or any citations in the uh, documentation, document that would visit that we can, we can, you know, refer to on the basis of the strength of the arguments. And that's what my question is. My question is that um, where, what kind of documentation or, or evidence that we can get to statistically, um, how is it statistically motivated? Or, about the arguments on the 
Well, first I want to address the argument of IQs. The study that was done, it showed, and, and of course I will definitely send you the source of, of this research, what it showed is that for, they did a case study of two, I think they used two twin, twin brothers, and like they had one to smoke marijuana. But what it found out is that starting from an early age, and that was, the paramount of our arguments, the youth, how do you protect the youth from the effects of, of marijuana? Start, starting to smoke marijuana from a very early age, over the years, consistent use of marijuana, that is what lowers your IQ. So if you start at, say, maybe 25, that's young, 30, it would not have as much of a drastic effect on you as, as a child starting at, say, age 14, 16. So the younger that you start smoking marijuana, the greater the effects it will have on your brain. And, and that's what our argument was centered around. Secondly, would you second question in terms of the citing? Every point that I made, I cited where I got the information from, the 17 billion US. I said it's according to the Trinidad and Tobago Guardian. The issues are in terms of the drug for trade, I cited the Jamaica Vina, and of course, the, the Association of Caribbean Police and Chiefs. If you have noticed, most of the information that we presented when it's not necessarily medical based or. Uh, no, no, it's pretty factual. It's pretty factual. It's pretty factual. Throughout our speech, we know we at no point in time try to to discredit the importance of, of different uses of cannabis. We had no point did, we had no point did that. Our argument was very clear. Said Lucia need to put the proper regulations in place before choosing to legalize cannabis. We we never said no, we never want you to legalize cannabis in St. Lucia, not ever. We, our argument was clear. Is St. Lucia at this point in time ready and able to accept the consequences and, ram and, and ramifications of full legalization? So everything I've pre presented here tonight, I can assure you, is very factual. And I will be sure to email you all my sources. Thank you very much. Should be. <laughs> because 
I take it what you say about being ready, and of course we do know we have to be ready in terms of putting the proper regulations in the legislation and the correct framework. So this is something we have to be very ready to put properly. And yes, we have to be reminded. Um, we need a bit, of, a bit of a boost in terms of we haven't done it right for many years, but we're trying. And you know, the youth and persons coming up want to be encouraged that it can be done. So it is true in the US, you know, they have gone ahead and patented and Jamaica has gone ahead and done so much, but we still need to do for ourselves. Because you have heard and you should know the great benefits of cannabis. So why should we have to end up importing? Whereas we can grow our own and prepare our own. And if we set it up properly, yes, we will get markets. I want to make the other point that it's very, very important in terms of the education to present the facts. And I'm very disappointed that in presenting cannabis, you couldn't tell us, you know, the basic things that Dr. King was able to tell us about cannabis, you know, the sweet cheese. But very, very important. And something when I speak to persons in all walks of life, you know, they're so, you know, taken aback that this cannabis sativa which has the same name as hemp, industrial hemp. And uh, the members of my cannabis movement, in particular, Pancho Perry and Randall Bain, for years and years and years, 30 years, have presented the industrial hemp initiative. We are bugged down with a law here in St. Lucia, which has made cannabis illegal. And guess what? has made hemp illegal. Hemp that you can use for food. If you want gluten-free food, you can get it from hemp. If you want dairy-free milk, you can get it from hemp. If you want the best moisturizer that we dermatologists can use, you can get it from hemp. So many products, clothing, and so many things from industrial hemp. But we, you know, have been handcuffed without being able to use our hemp just because it has the same name as marijuana. Anyway, let me start with the marijuana. Marijuana, which is the female plant, the flower of the female plant. And this is where all this great medicinal benefit resides. And it's very, very important to differentiate the two plants. Because right away tomorrow morning, if we were ready for action for our people, we could just say, you know, hemp is okay. There's nothing, 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 no argument as such could give against hemp, and our people would benefit. But in terms of medicine and marijuana, you know, it has so many benefits. Glaucoma is the commonest cause of blindness in the Caribbean. And 30 plus years ago, Professor Manny West out of Jamaica made some jobs for glaucoma. All these years, it hasn't been marketed enough, and now it's still struggling to have it on the market. But it has proven to be pure for glaucoma. And some of my people here, they know that. They make a infusion of the marijuana leaves and wash their eyes not as effective as drops, which, you know, the University of the West Indies, where Professor Mandy West has been able to put on the market. Asthma, a very common problem, especially as we get more pollution. And they did develop some asthma pumps, just like everybody from Ventolin and Degatide steroids. They have the inhalers made out of marijuana. And there are lots of testimonies, persons who never got the opportunity of using these inhalers, they drank the tea, 
of marijuana, and they can tell you some of them have been pure. A lot of them will not tell you that, because, hey, where did you get it? <laughs> <laughs> but there have been lots of documentation. And I can go on and on with a lot of medicinal effects of cannabis, and we have been deprived. Where are the pharmaceutical industry bringing in all of these drugs that have the side effects? And some of them cannot even work. We know of cases of epilepsy that you know cannot be controlled with conventional methods. So there is, you know, a lot of positives for medicine. But I will go back to the fact that you know we have to have proper management. Proper management and put the correct regulations and legislation in place, like Dr. Kim says, to make it happen. And we can, we will try, we will endeavor to do it right to benefit. Another question. 
question uh, to anybody um, on the panel. So, uh, as we heard over and over time, marijuana has many medical uses. There's many things with medical uses, um, such as, take for example, morphine. Now, I can tell you now, if they legalize morphine, I'll be first in line for it. So, the question is, you, you, you cannot just get morphine for recreational use. So if we, have, if we need marijuana for medical use, does that mean we have to legalize it for recreational use as well? Just because the guy who has no need it, just, um, and the guy who might need it, or his religion might need it, does that mean the guy who just wants to get high on a Friday night also needs to be able to access it? Just before I get to anybody from the sun, I want to take it and then I'll go. Morphine is legal to do people's drugs. Sorry? There's a legal regime for morphine. There's a legal regime for morphine. Yeah. Right. So you cannot just get it. So, so that's what I mean. So if you have. So that's an example of a, of a control. That's an example of you being able to get a drug legally. I would describe morphine for you but so that's an example of a legal environment that allows the drug. I think the definition you gave about what's legal, right? It's legal for me to give you morphine. Right? Now, where, where, how, how, how many other avenues of legality do you want to now make available? That's the debate. And in fact, I was going crazy. I was, there's a paper that I should send to you, which is from the Canadian Substance Abuse um, Commission which talks about the cognitive development and the studies that, um, that you are alluding to. And they, 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 they do say that you know, if, you start, if, uh, if somebody starts using cannabis before the age of 15, that uh, there was a decline of 3.71 in the IQ units. But I just want to show you how complicated this whole debate is. However, when the results were controlled for the effects of sex, socioeconomic status, maternal factors, mental health, and other drug use, the cannabis effect was attenuated. So in other words, it's never a simple matter. It's a point I was trying to make. It's a person um, using a particular substance that they can watch. But that person is coming from a particular environment, a particular history, with a particular makeup. And there are other factors that are playing in, in our observed, um, what we're observing. And sometimes we, we blame it on the cannabis. Like the mental health issues, there are people that will tell you that it's not the cannabis that's causing the mental health issues, it's the person who's prone, and the cannabis, if anything, is a host interaction now. So there's a person, there's a drug, and there's the two of them together. Or the person, the substance, and two of them together. Um, but, it, but I mean, it's a, still a debate that I'm going to be careful, which is why in a legal environment, we have to say that adolescent youth use should not be allowed. And we do that to education first and foremost. I want to thank you from NYC. Education is the social vaccine that we have to use for all of these things. So, answer me now, thank you for my Yeah, good night. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming to WonderCon. The Office of the DPP, as well as the uh, Bar Association for hosting this. Uh, event um, on behalf of the cannabis movement, which many of the people involved here have been attending meetings for the last eight years. It's great to see that other people are taking up the conversation now. So I, I, I thank everybody for this. Um, just to straighten out what we intend to do, because there are a lot of misconceptions about legalization and decriminalization. CARICOM just completed their recommendations and basically we have many territories in the Caribbean that have different cultures, different acceptance levels when it comes to, to, to the herb. Jamaica, Vinci, St. Lucia, pretty liberal. The police in Trinidad, if they hold you with a roadshow going down, in handcuffs, you're going to spend the night. The police in St. Lucia will, will pass somebody going in, and if he pounds it, it's okay. That could never happen in Trinidad, Tobago, Grenada, 
Barbados. So although CARICOM has actually uh, has a broad based sort of template to work from, our challenge is to, to create regulations that would suit and um, be acceptable for the majority of St. Lucia. Everybody is not going to like what we come out with, but basically, we're looking at harm reduction and prevention strategies really heavily, and it's through education. For us to continue what we intend to do, we need the government to give us a go-ahead. Because then we have to come up with a curriculum that would be acceptable for secondary schools so that we can get people into the schools and speak to the people's children. Now, is that message what parents are going to agree to hear? So what we are proposing is national consultation, meaning that the cannabis movement with the approval and the funding of the government will go to community centers and town halls and actually educate people, question and answer sessions, much like this, but with a standard curriculum that is approved by the government. Also, too, we're going to have stakeholder meetings the um, St. Lucia Tourist Board, um, the, by the way, the uh, Police Welfare Association is supporting legalization, but we need to get to them. We need to go to, to the uh, Manufacturers Association, the Conference of Churches, the Secondary Schools Principals Association, and they have a big problem. They have 11 and 10 year olds and bringing weed to school and smoking weed. But the principals came to one of our um, events, and the principals actually said, the Rasta children in the school, and the children of Rasta parents are not the problem. And this needs to highlight exactly how education can help us. Because in the household, in the Rasta Parai household, cannabis is freely consumed. So the young Rasta kid will go to school, he knows where to get his home. He knows mom and dad ain't making nothing. And he will go to school and study school work. But like my parents, we was the worst thing. So I had to lie to my parents when I was smoking weed. And that's what's happening right now. A lot of youths in middle class households love their weed after lying to their parents. Are you smoking weed? No. That's the reality of it. And this is now going to make parents and kids separate from each other. So one of our proposals is that we actually educate parents on how to deal with their kids and speak to them about drugs. And we can learn from the Rasta example. So it's about education, education, education. Part of the regulations is developing um, laws based on the no smoking of tobacco. There's a bill that was supposed to be passed by Dr. Bristol since 2011 that regulates use of tobacco. And we would like Ganja to be, be back in on that bill. So everything that relates to tobacco consumption will now be related to cannabis. So wherever you could smoke a cigar, pipe or a cigarette, we will smoke a joint. Now that leads us to now developing and creating areas where it would be permissible to smoke. And that has to be national consultation. So if the government gives us permission tomorrow to start this, we are looking at 12 months before implementation. Because we will need to go to the people and hear the people's concerns and try to deal with it in the best way. So that when we do come up with, record, with, with our, our policy, our new act, it is something that the majority of the country agree to. So this is what we're working for now. And we hope that people would support the move for the government to give us permission to start. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take a lot of consultation. But that's where we are. So if there's... I mean, I could go on and talk for two more hours about where we will have to be. But something that is happening is that 
for the last three years, massive corporations have been contacting our organization wanting to find out what's going on. We plan to, to form a growers cooperative. So anybody that is growing commercial has to be part of the growers cooperative. And these organizations want to come and set up factories where the growers now will be supplying the factories to make extracts for export, medical extracts. I've been in contact with some pretty high people up in the United States. Us exporting ganja is a decade away. So we need to think about growing ganja for one, the tourism market. 400,000 cruise ship visitors visited here. And 400,000 people spent seven days or more in St. Lucia. That's almost a million people. If 10% of those people spend 100 US, we're talking $15 million US. When, when, you, look, when you look at the VAT, 12.5% of that right, will go into government coffers. Also, we have a local industry that's going on now, and I know the panel said while well, we jumped in on the bandwagon, people have to remember when Mount Jimmy occurred. The Rastaman has been fighting this for four decades. We've killed people. Shakadan Daniel was my friend. He was murdered because of weed. Nasa down in Marigou was shot in the back of his head because he had some side bags and was afraid of the police. We doesn't kill people. Police die because weed is illegal. And we need to change that. Bosangja, condolences to his family. They put in weed on the man to discredit a black man. That law was created in 1937 by racist people to discriminate against black people. We're in 2018, and it's happening right in front of our eyes. And for any black man to support a racist white law, we need to go home and think about where you are. would have also liked to answer the question that I posed that um, Dr. King had started to do. Just to shortly address the question that was posed by Justin. No, you don't have to you don't have to fully legalize marijuana in order to use it for the benefits that it may have. What I like to reflect on is the Jamaican model. And it's not in any court because I'm Jamaican. However, I believe that whilst it may not be perfect, it is a step in the right direction. Because what Jamaica has done is to realize that yes, marijuana has benefits, and yes, we need to respect the religious rights, so constitutional rights of our Rastafarians, and yes, hemp is useful, and yes, scientific research is necessary on this product. But what they have done is to do limited legalization and to properly regulate how it is that licenses, permits, and authorizations are given to the proper institutions or religious sect that are in need of this drug or this plant. To make it not um, to make it not biased. Therefore, whilst we can acknowledge the benefits of marijuana and whilst it may be very plentiful, we also need to accept that it's not necessary to fully legalize it for all and sundry, and that proper regulations can be done and the model is out there to be followed. In the end, the grand scheme is to ensure that the economic benefit of marijuana does not outweigh its social cost. Thank you. I would like to speak to my personal experience. I broke this arm last October and have not been able to move my hand. I just spent two months in New York and I was, a friend of mine gave me CBD cream, which smells just like Vaseline. I can move it. You see that? 
I haven't been able to sail, therefore I became depressed. <laughs> so I can only ride on a sailboat, as many people will tell you, but I couldn't sail myself. So when I actually got my hands on this crane, when I actually got my hands on this crane, I could move my hands. I was getting horrific arthritis in these fingers. I would wake up with my hands stiff. Now on a couple of other points, uh, one, the reason that marijuana got buried was because it didn't have the alcohol and the tobacco lobby. Don't let that be part of your street. Now that I've got my back, to say one more thing that I think people in this room should know. And that is, there is something, there is something happening right now. I don't know how to pronounce the word, but if whatever the word is for uh, a want. There's a project that's allegedly going through the stakeholder process. I accidentally got it up, out of the meeting on Monday, the day I got back. I went to the meeting. There were like 15 stakeholders there. And they have the UNEP, UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, uh, Global Environment Facility, GM, a bunch of experts have made phase one, phase two, and phase three. They have three options. And they are going to make a north south link road. Now, I've, been, I've made a lot of films about what roads do. And this road is going to cut right through your forest, and it will, just, it will be very destructive. The last day you can make a public comment is September 29th. So they're about to pass another one on us, folks. It's the Trans Amazon, Trans Amazon Highway destroyed the Amazon. I was there to witness it. So please figure this out. Find it, Google it, do something, and make your public statement. And please let us have CBD cream here because I need it personally. <laughs> personally. And I can hardly wait to get back to New York and do so I can get some more. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Aiden Wallace, attorney at law. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this event, and I wanted to just share my own um, thoughts on marijuana. In fact, I'm happy to have this opportunity because um, my practice has put me in, a, in an interesting position where I've had the opportunity to go to the custody suites and interact with people who are who've been arrested for a violent attack, and one in that circumstance is forced to say to themselves, does that person deserve to be here? Or for some other some other circumstance, and you, you, you will inevitably ask yourself that question. But then when you interact with someone who is incarcerated for marijuana, you ask yourself the question, does this person deserve to be here. Certain things will, will inevitably run through your mind and you will you will be forced to consider various things and so on and so forth. Now there is a lot of to my mind fear and stigma which are attached to marijuana being being illegal in the first instance. Fear because there seems to be a general thinking that the marijuana user is a, a, a dangerous person, a bad person, and, and stigma. Stigma because if Dr. King's or any other person's child becomes a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, that person is expected perhaps to go have a drink with their son. And so if Ms. Glasgow's son becomes a doctor, she's expected to go have a drink with her son, and nobody looks at her as a crazy person because there's no stigma. Whereas if her son became a doctor and she said, well, let's go have a smoke, everyone is going to say, oh my God, she's this crazy person. Yeah. Now, I clearly remember watching the news as a young child, the Spirit of St. Lucia bounty rum. I have never seen a bounty rum tree. You never seen a, a, a pizza or bear tree. Never seen a Heineken tree. I've never seen a, a, a Chairman's Reserve tree. So the long and short of we we have to wrap our heads around the what I call the madness, the absolute madness of the fact that a person purchases a portion of land, and whether you believe in God or the Big Bang, if you believe in God, you believe God created marijuana. If you believe
believe in the Big Bang, you believe there was a Big Bang, and marijuana came about. <laughs> so, there is marijuana on a portion of land that you purchased. You've taken some of it, you put it into a house, and here we come to arrest you. And they want you to just consider the absolute madness of that. That a person is being arrested for a plant. It is a plant. Whether you believe in the Big Bang or you believe in God, it remains an absolute plant. So, so just as I believe you should not be in possession of this rock, but you didn't create this rock, whether it's God or the Big Bang, I'm putting you in prison for a rock. Or a plant. It is. It is the absolute madness, and it is. It, 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 it is really us being in a state of uh, us being a state where we we learn something and we don't question it, and we just absorb it. So there was a there was a time when a legitimate joke was this black person wants to be a postman or a lawyer or a doctor, and that was a legitimate joke. There was a time when a legitimate joke was Mr. Justin would gather with his male friends and he would say, my wife wants to work. And that was a, that, that was a, a, that was a, a, a good joke, you know? And a, a serious joke, when I say a serious joke, it was actually laughable. Because this woman wants to be a secretary. This woman wants to be a, a, a doctor. This woman wants to be a lawyer. That is madness. But now, we have moved beyond that kind of thing. I think we need to seriously consider moving beyond the madness of, in, of incarcerating people for possession of a plant. Because that is what we are doing. That is what and I see across the room, Mr. Mr. Bain. Whom I remember talking about hemp when I was when, when I was much younger and saying this hemp can be used to make rope and all that kind of thing. We need to be in a position where we can make something. We need to we, we need to make something that we can export that, or, and that we can get revenue from. For instance, for, for instance, we had bananas at one stage. Now. I, I, I remember listening to this young lady who said she went to school with Darren Sammy and he would literally, her words, she said he would literally cry when it was time to go to class because he had a bat and a ball on him constantly and all he wanted to do was play cricket. Now just imagine what that would happen if Darren Sammy didn't pursue his desire to play cricket. The long and short of it is that we all have a thing so that if we decide we want to grow apples, we could never grow apples that could compare to what Canada can produce. Our thing that we can produce, in fact, to take us out of poverty, would have to be in the marijuana range because the long and short of it is that no territory, in fact, in the in, in the US and, and England where they produce they, they, where they where they produce marijuana in these greenhouses. There are all kinds of complications with, 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 with the side effects and so on, the, 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 the synthetic um, compounds. If we, the marijuana that we produce here will always be of, of a far better quality. And there, without question, marijuana assists in um, ailments such as asthma, um, glaucoma, particularly where you have young children having seizures, and the only thing that can help them is the marijuana oils as well as marijuana tourism. So that, again, you do not want a, a, a kind of a free-for-all where, where um, young children are given marijuana. So that we can say, look, we can, we, can establish, we can establish school zones. We can say, do not uh, smoke in the presence of a child. We can have a, 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 an age limit. We can have all of these things. I think these things are important. But they, they the, 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 the thinking that marijuana should be should be outlawed, to my mind, is, is, is extremely destructive. And, and to touch on the fear and the and the thinking that we cannot handle it. But guess what? In places like Ansari, I can assure you, it is already decriminalized because nobody. <laughs> I can assure you. I can assure you. 
No, the <laughs> question is like, the question is like, sorry, I will say so, I will say so. People do not, people do not, mar marijuana is used there, I mean, I've observed it without any, any, without any crazy behavior, without any crazy behavior by the users, in the first instance. In the second instance, without any excessive, without any excessive harassment by the police. Yes, and, and lastly, what I really wish is that all of those, I mean, I'm not one of them, but I, do, I, I, I wouldn't venture to, to judge or criticize. And I would say this, I wish every doctor or lawyer or accountant who actually uses marijuana, because you see, we, we, we seem to believe, no seriously, we seem to believe that um, the marijuana user is the Rastafarian. The, the Rastafarian is the admitted user. But, but, they, but the reality is there are, there are doctors who use marijuana, and I wish they would come forward and say, look, I, no, seriously, I wish they would come forward and say, look, I, I did your surgery yesterday, you fine, and I use marijuana, so you can relax. I wish the accountants would do the same thing, and so on and so forth, because there are quite a few people who use marijuana, but they hide. Well, very well, so, so, because they hide again because of fear, because of stigma. So so again, the, the, somebody's son becomes a, an accountant, and well, hey, I'm going to go have a drink with my son. We're going to go have some alcohol, and that's fine. Nobody looks at me as a crazy person if I take my son for a drink, because it's our doctor. But if I'm going to do the same for, for, for marijuana, again, stigma, I have to be crazy. So I think we need to we, we need to be far more open-minded if we and again for economic reasons as well. It is almost as if, like I was saying to someone, it's almost as if you, you can sing. And so singing would if you could earn a, a more than decent living through singing. But either you refuse to sing or have insisted that you must not sing. And because I've insisted that you must not sing, you almost doomed into poverty. Because the thing that you can that, that can get you out of poverty, you refuse to participate in, or you've been you've been restricted from participating in it. So thank you. But I I, I want to hope that everyone. Will... See the police have used it. Should we come forward? To I think we all recognize the benefits. We've been hearing it for years. We know what the benefits are. We all like to say, scratch all the laws, the hell with it all. And this is what we're going to do, full legalization or however we want to do it. But be mindful, folks. As independent as we say we are, 29 years, we are really not independent. And we have we sick America standing there. And don't okay, care what we say here, our governments are not going to to do what we need to do, because big state America is standing there saying, hell no, and our government have no option. We have to do this step by step. I have to support my friends here on the side. <laughs> as good as the argument is on the other side, we really have to take small steps, and we can only do what they allow us. Unfortunately, those are our circumstances. Because all they have to do is to cut back the funding and cut back everything else that is handed to us. And we will, we won't even be able to sell the marijuana that we grow. We do get funding. There is no way, there is no way St. Lucia or any of these small islands are going to survive without the support of those larger states. We have to tow the line. We have a simple, no, I promise not to be long, 
but at just one simple situation. All they have to do is to cut off our banks and say Musha is dead. Simple. Because we are growing or legalizing marijuana, they cut back on the banks. The banks have no access to the U.S. banks, and our economy is dead. Simple as that. Night, <laughs> 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 everyone. I'm glad everybody showed up. Thanks for coming out. And I want to make a public. I want to make a public announcement here. I like this forum. I would like to all invite you back sometime in January when we have a date because I, I think we have a lot of issues to to deal with among ourselves as solutions. And I think we should spend a lot more time dealing with what we really can fix. One of the things I really want to fix, I want to do it in January, is the question of illegitimacy. So I'm inviting everybody else in January, we'll get a date to talk about this issue. Okay, thank you very much. One, one last word from the king. Yeah, I think. Lauren, no, 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 no. Just because to respond to you, are right about the United States and you're right about the drug convention. But in the, you know, um, there's a, this justice, Dr. Rathway in Jamaica, in the Ganja Commission report, he says it very well that you know what we must do is when once you see in the conventions. The Supreme Convention is a human rights convention. And you can you can opt out of or you can get away from your drug conventions if you show that in conflict with the human rights. In the Caribbean, and in fact the case of the of how religious rights, he makes a point that the Rastafarians are actually a spearhead for the Caribbean with regards to the religious use of the planet. Because I say human rights, so the human rights. Also, the privacy rights, which are coming up now, even in, even 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 the South Africa, just what's it yesterday, the right to privacy in your home, um, that that is that is being argued quite effectively as well. And of course, medicinal rights uh, are are well argued. So I mean, I think that um, we there are arguments that we can put up against um, the U.S. position and the U.N. position for that matter. Um, the fact that the Canadians have and the government of Canada has just moved as they have, is going to, I think, also be a game changer in the North American continent. Um, the fact that more than half of the United of the states of the United States have already gone. I think after the Trump administration has moved on, there will probably be a, 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 a movement, the undamming of, of the federal resistance. Um, because it's a bad, right now, it is a violation, and I think that that can be addressed. And and the, the, the last point of this is that that is why the, the countries Jamaica, Antigua, and Venice talk, talk about decriminalization. But like Maurice said very well, they are not truly decriminalization. They are actually hybrid legalization models with, with some ma masquerading as decriminalized. And that is to get away from the United States' um, heavy hand. Um, yeah. Sorry, Lord. Um, just very quickly, in my case, I think everybody should uh, read when they get the chance. It's very instrumental. Out of the CCJ, those familiar with it here will re remember it was the Jamaican national, the lady who was treated so horribly at Franklin Adams. That president supports the full provision of our international conventions, primarily the single convention on narcotics I mentioned earlier, as having an entrenched human rights approach. Essentially, Remember, treaty, these conventions are based on the principle of consensus among states. So, Lorraine's point is very, very important. Because the, the U.S. has de facto legalized without being found in contradiction of international law and conventions in the name of legal flexibility, that's of no comfort to us here. She mentioned the big sticks, so I accept that. However, like um, Dr. King said, with traditional allies like Canada, several states in Latin America movement, global first. I guess we have to hope that we be first, and the fact that the medical evidence and the voice suggests that needs to be done, that is going to be enough of a push, and that they have little or no moral authority, much less the will, to 
challenges in the region if we continue to push out. But we can probably continue moving. I, I acknowledge what you say. I totally agree with you, Dr. King. The point is we talk about getting on the bandwagon. We're going to be on that bandwagon at the tail end. Because unless Canada can get through and all the other states, we're not going to get anyway. We have to be on that bandwagon at the tail end and follow through. Otherwise, we're going to get left behind. Correct. Correct. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I see your hands up. Let's unfortunately, um, as much as I'd like to stay here online, I did bring my sleeping bag. Um, and my car is now um, Yes, um, well, I'm sure we can mingle among ourselves afterwards. And, and no, I think everybody would like to hear what happens. I think everybody would like to hear what happens. Just allow me to give the vote of hands before. Uh, before we break up, uh, the arguments on both sides were powerful. I'd like to thank the panel for preparing them and you know taking the time in our interest. And uh, I mean, certainly they were powerful arguments. I even the Pancho at one point thinking about changing the yeah. the marijuana movement. You know, different. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. He's gone back. He's decided to stay. It's okay. Um, but. And, and to, to the panel again, if you know, if somebody had walked in here, they might have thought it was a marijuana campaign or something. But I assure the media, it's not a marijuana campaign, as no. it kind of sounded like sometimes. It was a balanced debate on both sides. And I'd like to thank the media again and thank the Bar Association for their assistance in, in this debate. Thank you most of all for coming out. I didn't know who would show up. Um, uh, but obviously, it's a, a topic of public interest. Um, in that regard, if you have anything that you think would benefit from being on a public debate um, platform, then just shout out. What do you think? Free legal aid! Free legal aid. We have those here like club overseas league, but it's not that kind of party. Right? <laughs> but if you have any suggestions like free legal aid, which is. Well, we have legal aid. Um, <laughs> but yes, um, anyway, I mean, you, you have our contacts, contact the Power Association or be directly at the DPP's office if you think you, uh, there's anything that you'd like to see us put on the next time. Mrs. Glass already has an idea for January, um, but do contact us anyway. Um, just to add, we can have a debate or at least a session on legal aid so the public will have a better understanding about what we refer to as legal aid. Okay? Sometime in the new year. Thank you, Mrs. Charles. Someone said the next one should be on the legalization of cannabis, but we cannot keep it. <laughs> well, it was very stimulating. So, we can have another session sometime. Yeah. Well, let's say, yeah, you like another session? Every two months. Something else. Every two months. Something else. We say every <laughs> but, um, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming. Let me not uh, forget to thank our moderator. Um,
Okay, we'll see. All right. So look at my email and then. Okay then. <laughs> I brought a thing for you. Oh, the